Good evening and welcome to Sunday Night Night Live. And this is one of our rare recorded programs because the studio would not be closed this day because of a holiday or something like that. And so, as I always do, I try to have questions. And my good friend, Father John Lynch, uh, is pastor up in Ellenville, New York, and he's been coming with me for years, being our host of the uh, questions. Thank you, John. You're welcome. And uh, we have a good group of questions that people have sent into us in the past couple of months, and so that will move right into that. I usually have something sarcastic to say about the New York Times or the other things coming after the church, but I don't have them right with me now. Unfortunately, recently I noticed that Time magazine has become rather anti-Catholic, and that's very unfortunate. I used to enjoy Time magazine, but I'm too busy now, and now I won't read it at all. So, uh, Father John, what have you got? All right. Al has this to say. With all the terrible news about the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, I am left wondering what is the proper Catholic response to questions I hear such as, why doesn't God stop the oil leak? I just bristle when I hear God being somehow blamed for disasters like this. Well, down through the ages, there have been natural disasters, volcanoes, T tidal waves, earthquakes, all sorts of things like this in the history of the world, and small disasters that are large in people's lives if they fall or get burned or harmed by ma machinery. That's life. And if all of those things did not happen, or at least a particular group of them. For instance, no earthquakes stopped. There were no more. Then life would become rather magical. Uh, we would think that God is a music magician. What we need to do is to cope as best we can to natural evils and even the evils that are done because human will is there. Wars, things like that, or things that happen to an individual, like a person being murdered or harmed in some way. Life is filled with these things, all different kinds. And the oil spill, that's just one of many ones. The providence of God often, I think, causes things not to happen. I had the experience when I was hit by a car that I was 27 minutes technically dead, and I came back. Uh, how did that happen? Uh, any doctor or nurse will tell you that you couldn't do that, and especially if you came back with no blood pressure, no movement of blood in your veins, you couldn't think your brain would be destroyed. But here I am. So as we go through life, there are disasters, and there are things that could be disasters but don't happen. And uh, uh, we need to be thankful for the second ones and ask God's help and his providential assistance when the bad things happen. And this, by the way, would not be simply a Catholic answer. This would be not even just a Christian answer. This is all people who believe in a personal God. This is a question from W.G. Miller. I am one of the Jewish viewers of your show. 
We are friends with a devoutly Catholic family. I invited them and their children to attend one of our local temple's Friday night Sabbath services so that they can see how others worship God. Their reply surprised me. Good Catholics do not attend services of other faiths. Is it really church doctrine that Catholics should not attend such services? Years ago, before the Vatican Council, that was likely to be true. Uh, It was very rare that people of one denomination ever went to the services of another denomination, uh, including Catholics did not go to Protestant services. Now, with the coming of the Second Vatican Council and the beginning of uh, the ecumenical movement and the much better understanding between the different religions, by all means, you could allow and even have a good reason for someone to attain Protestant or Orthodox or Jewish or Muslim services. And uh, ordinarily, you are not called upon by the church to directly participate in the services, but uh, uh, you would not be uh, severely wrong to do that. Uh, Certainly, you could not receive, for instance, uh, a sacrament or something in a non-Catholic church. But uh, in the uh, ecumenical days, I I would figure... uh, In those ecumenical days, I participated as a preacher in about over 200 non-Catholic services. And uh, uh, even at Friday night services uh, at the synagogue. And uh, 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 I remember, I was very amusing, I was there, a dear friend of mine, is the rabbi, and uh, I had preached, and this dear old lady comes out, and she says to me, listen, if you ever change and you get married, I hope you marry a nice Jewish girl. <laughs> well, the rabbi could hardly contain himself. So I'm still here. I haven't gotten married. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we have much better understanding of other people's honest work and attempts to worship God. And uh, it's a different approach to think. The person who asked this had asked this in the way of thinking people before the thought uh, of the Council, Vatican Council. Diane says, can you speak more about abstinence from meat and prayer? Specifically, the use and application of abstinence and how it impacts the praying experience. In my understanding, if one wishes to add, for want of a better word, more divine force to their prayer intention, such as praying for the end to abortion, that abstinence is a good thing to do. Well, uh, Our Lord himself, when it was dealing with evil spirits, he encouraged people to not only abstain from meat, but to fast, abstinence and fast. And that's what we use in Lent and other days like that. And that means no meat and one main meal and two small little luncheons or breakfast, and nothing between meals. That would be really uh, penitential. Giving up meat and having uh, uh, lobster thermidor, uh, or people doing things like that, you know, sturgeon, uh, uh, it's not terribly penitential. In our society, uh, people eat fish, as something of a luxury. 
So I would say fast and abstinence. And it's a good thing for your soul. Why? Because it traditionally, in most of the religions of the world, fasting has lifted up your heart and soul. And uh, it is not simply Catholicism or Christianity, but other religions of the world. In Islam, what is called Ramadan, uh, uh, I think it's about 30 days, you're not allowed to eat until sunset and not to drink any water till sunset. That's a very real penitential experience. And uh, uh, in, in what is called uh, uh, Jewish Lent during the holy days, especially Yom Kippur, you, a devout Jew will not eat anything mm -hmm. on Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. So, and probably the other religions of the world have similar disciplines. This is a discipline that is called ascetics. And ascetics is a good thing for us all. Bernadette offers this. As a person of faith who is trying to grow in holiness, I am well aware of my sins, things I do that I shouldn't do. Lately, I am more concerned about the things I should do and don't. I was warned long ago by a wise priest who told me to examine my sins of omission. Can you tell me more? Well... Right in the gospel, our divine Savior is very clear about omission, particularly in Matthew 25. I, I, you, you did not give me to eat, and I was hungry. You did not give me to drink when I was thirsty. It's an omission. And they didn't even realize it. They said, when did, when did we not give you food and, and things like this? So that's a perfect example of an omission. And there are innumerable opportunities, particularly as our person wrote in, trying to grow in their spiritual life. First, to avoid obvious sinful behavior. But then, recognizing things like the need to visit the sick, to help others, to do acts of mer mercy, to generosity for the poor and good causes, uh, to be an in citizen who's involved in what other people need. That is a positive Christian life. Uh, Christianity is about doing good things. And I think uh, other religions as well. However, in Christianity, because of the parables, our divine Savior constantly calls upon us to do actions of generosity and courtesy and self-sacrifice for other people. Uh, without looking on any other religion, let it say, very, very clear, clear, clearly, a Christian must be a generous person. If they are not, they are a contradiction of their own religious beliefs. And the parables and the holy example of our Lord Jesus Christ and the saints. Uh, you read the history of the Catholic saints, like St. Saint Vincent de Paul, St. Francis, uh, Mother, Cabr Mother Cabrini, Mother Teresa. Uh, you see, these are people of charity. Mother Teresa, sist mothers, sist missionaries of charity. And she gave herself away. We have a little break now.
right, what's our next question? Jim offers this. Over the years, I have heard many voices speaking out for the victims of abortion, an absolutely worthy cause. But your program was the first time I have heard anyone publicly acknowledge the tragedy of the other unborn, those children who die through miscarriage, stillbirth, SIDS, and other infant death causes. I believe that by bringing the grief which families suffer in each of these situations out of the shadows, we would be highlighting the truth of the sanctity of life in the womb. I found the Pope's declaration that there is every reason to hope that God has taken the unborn directly to himself a great comfort. I have begun to pray to our two children to intercede for us in our times of need. I hope this is in keeping with church teaching, and I can't help thinking it would also be a great solace to parents who have repented of their abortions. What do you think? Well, it's a big question, and there's a lot of pieces to it. Let's start off by saying that from a human sorrow, tragedy, is the death of an unborn child or the death of a really recently born child. And it must be one of the saddest things for being parents. Uh, I'm not a parent, but I've been with so many families going through those terrible tragedies. And like so many things, why? And Jesus himself said, why? Why am I? Why have you abandoned me? Says on the cross. So, <laughs> it's understandable very, very much that a person can feel this and perhaps even be angry at God. They'll get through that. God has got very broad shoulders and he's quite capable of putting it up if people get angry at him. In the Bible, there's a lot of people get angry at God. Now, what about the possibility of salvation or eternal life for an unborn child or an unbaptized child? In past centuries, the interpretation of the Bible by Christians and by other people, by Jews, uh, by Muslims, and they use parts of the Bible, we were very, very literal. That was the way that people thought and perhaps uh, did not know that. There's very little ex extreme literalism in the United States now. Even uh, very conservative Protestants call uh, uh, fundamentalists. They shy away now from extreme literalism. It, it, it doesn't fit well with our Lord himself, who did not be a literalist. And, but in ancient times, even up into the 19th century, people felt or believed that an unborn child was not saved. St. Augustine, working on this uh, as uh, uh, early Christian theologians who had just been a convert himself, he came up with the idea that on the edge of heaven was a, a, a nice place. It wasn't heaven, but it wasn't hell. And he used the name limbo which means the edge, the limbo, the lim, 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 limons of a window, of a window, uh, uh, the leman, outside the limits. And uh, so, <clears throat> and that idea came into the church very strongly. So even as a boy, <coughs> I heard about limbo and they tell me that limbo has been closed out 
It was never a theological dogma, but it was a popular belief. And now, and the Pope himself has used this, that the mercy of God calls all unbaptized children, unborn and born, that we have a different way of thinking about salvation. In his most recent encyclical on hope, Spe salve, save, save, yes, salvation through hope, Pope Benedict talks about how people who don't know about faith, uh, about the Christian faith, may be easily saved through God's mercy <coughs> and by being good people. And uh, if you have an opportunity, you should lead the last several pages of that great encyclical, Spe Salve, Saved by Hope. And in that way, we look at the immense numbers of people who are not baptized, but it's no cause of theirs. They didn't know. And uh, I, I was a teenager, <coughs> a devout teenager, and I used to worry about this. One of my dear friends was an old Jewish man. He was a, uh, I write him in one of my new books, Mr. Graff, and he was a spiritual writer, a, a, a director, advisor. Uh, he was a, a, not an educated man, but he was very, very religious and wise. And when I was a kid, I used to worry about Mr. Graff. But now, I really believe that God sees that this person has the best of intentions of doing God's will. Now, I'm not going to call Mr. Graff up and say, you really baptized Mr. Graff. He would probably not be too thrilled about that. But let's leave it there. Let's put it into the hands of God. And uh, when I was, the day I left home to become a friar, 17 years old, in a black suit that the priest gave it to me in the parish, and Mr. Graff cut it down, opened the back of the jacket, and bolted it together to give me a nice black suit. And I, I went in to say goodbye, and he said, look, I don't understand about monasteries, but I'll give you a piece of advice. I said, what's that? Be a good boy. Be a good boy. And that's 60 years ago, and I can see it by lie. Be a good boy. So let us have a love for the souls that God calls. Jesus says in the gospel about those who were very judgmental about others. And he said they will come from the north and the south and from the east and the west and they sit, will sit down with Abraham and Isaac in the kingdom of God. The people we're talking to were not Jews. They were the Gentiles from the north and the south and the east and the west. So our Lord says that salvation goes out. And uh, I realize some people, not only Catholics, but some very uh, conservative Protestants or some very conservative Jews or Muslims may see the gates of heaven tightly close and a few people getting in because they got their, their card with them. Uh, their little card. I wonder, when I think of the ga gates of heaven, I see the Son of God standing before the gates and saying, come to me, all you who labor and are heavily burdened. That's what Jesus said. Uh, and uh, I myself 
have great hope. And what do we got some help there, Father? Well, Bill is asking, can a divorced Catholic who has not remarried and is not living with someone still receive Holy Communion? There seems to be some confusion among my friends on this issue. They're completely confused. A person who has been divorced and is not remarried and not with an annulment has no, no limitations on receiving the sacraments. None at all. Uh, and uh, that, I don't know where that idea ever came from, uh, but it was, I'm sure there never was in the history of the Catholic Church uh, a theologian or a priest who ever taught that. People misunderstand. If you're divorced, you can't go to communion. Uh, what they're saying is you're divorced and remarried without an annulment. And, uh, and we need to be very sympathetic to people in that situation and try to understand them and help them because they're struggling. I, I, none of us should ever rejoice that someone else is suffering. We should suffer with them and for them. Tom and Diane are concerned. Our son calls himself a Satanist. He has rejected Christ and the Church. We feel so helpless. We pray constantly. He is 19, and everyone says it is a phase, but it has lasted too long, over a year now. Is there a special prayer we can say for him? Absolutely. This is a very serious thing, and uh, it will disturb the family. It will ultimately cause a great deal of trouble in the person's life. Uh, eh, why would you want to be uh, a friend of the wickedest thing in the world? And Satan destroys his own friends. Uh, they all go off to eternal punishment together. Now, the poor, poor boy has been misled. And uh, what I would say, because you actually could not like or choose for something so evil, you're accepting it and approving of it without understanding it. It, it, it. This confusion. What's the best thing to do? To pray. And pray for deliverance. Uh, call upon the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ every day on that bo bo boy that the Holy Spirit will come to him and the precious blood of Jesus will wash away this evil influence in his life. And he very easily may. He might end up being a very devout person. All of this, you know, uh, uh, in the history of the saints, many people uh, got themselves involved with great evil and it was the beginning of their conversion and of a holy life. Every single day, I pray for everyone in the world by the precious blood of Jesus, for any, everyone in any way involved in the satanic uh, 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 control. And it's called not an exorcist, but a, de de a deliverance. And we can, all, none of us, you have to, only the bishop or his delegate can do an exorcism. Mm -hmm. But de deliverance can be done every day by every person. And the best time to pray after a person has received Holy Communion, mm -hmm. then Christ is right with you. And it's a serious thing. Now, sometimes teenagers 
do annoying things and they're not really understanding what they're doing. I hope that's true. But if he's doing it seriously, he could bring great difficulty into his own life, or disaster. And so pray and pray for him that he may get out of this. And especially to pray to St. Michael the Archangel. Uh, and we have the prayer against Satan. We used to say at the end of Mass, look in the back of a missile, Holy Michael, Archangel, defend us in the battle. I think we have another break now, so we will be back in another two minutes. offers this. I was hoping you might address for me what I consider to be a popular but false conception of God's mercy, one divorced from repentance and the requirements of justice. I hear much talk of mercy for the individual sinner that seems to me to be little more than an excuse for sinful behavior. Doesn't true mercy demand both repentance and justice? Well, here's a couple of things. First of all, there is a sin called presumption, that you are presuming on the goodness and mercy of God. So if a person is going ahead to do something wrong, particularly is going to hurt others or hurt themselves or bring dishonor to God, okay. and they're thinking they're going to get mercy about this, uh, that would be presumption and it's yet another sin. Then you have to, and my questioner there may be also struggling with the idea of people who do not have control over their own behavior. Uh, they're doing sinful things and uh, calling out to God's mercy and they can't do any better. For example, a person with addiction to drugs. A person who hates drugs, wants nothing to do with drugs, but their ad addiction draws them on and they can be calling out for God's mercy. And God's mercy would be leading them to repentance. In some cases, that may also be sexual sin. Some people are compulsive. They can't do any better for the moment. But the trouble is here, they may be presumption, doing presumptive. They, uh, they're taking advantage of God's mercy shrug their old shoulders and don't try. So it's important not to either encourage them or to judge them because we may be wrong. There is also another sin here which is called rash judgment and that is when we are not justified in making a judgment and we're assuming that a person has done X, Y, or Z badly, and it isn't true at all. And that's the sin of rash judgment. And almost never do you hear anybody ever speak about rash judgment, unjustifiable judgment. Uh, and uh, there, uh, so there is presumption, rash judgment, and, and then also we have to be careful about how we treat other people about their mistakes, 
their sins, their fall, false judgments. That could be rash judgment, and it could also be detraction. To speak about the sins of another person, and there is no reason to discuss those, that is detraction. Even though they have done something really wrong, it's nobody's business and nobody else concern. And then you have calumny, and I hear it around, people saying about another person, and they are assuming uh, that this person is doing this, that, or the other thing. And it's not right, not true at all. And uh, as a priest who's also a psychologist, Unfortunately, I hear a lot of uh, calumny and detraction around. Unfortunately, the media in our country is into detraction morning, noon, and night. Almost every day, the newspaper will celebrate, celebrate some false uh, or sinful behavior of a person. And uh, it's all over the place. Now, I know nothing about modern music, entertainment, you know. Uh, I haven't watched a television set in many years, except for the Pope one time. But there's a popular singer who recently passed away, and there's much talk about his and the guilt, uh, his uh, uh, loans and bills and uh, all sorts of things. You may know who I'm talking about. And I glanced at the news ma magazine about this man and why are they rejoicing? Why are they celebrating? Why are they popularizing? What all of this? Is it all true? It may not be true. Uh, and uh, what are they doing? And if it is true, isn't some of this his own private business or his family's business? Uh, his mother, I read, is very on in years and uh, is a good woman and is taking care of children, her little, his, his children. This poor woman is right in the middle of all of this, and her heart must be broken. And St. Paul says, charity does not rejoice at iniquity, but rejoices at the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. So any good Christian, any good believing religious person of any denomination does not rejoice at the failures, the moral failures, real or imagined, about popular figures. Mm. It's, I'm very horrified what I read in that article about all of this, about the alleged mistakes of this man and his abuse of his money. I don't know whether it's any of it true, but they're celebrating all over the place. And his mother is in her 80s and trying to take care of the kids. I said a little prayer for her the other day. Rich is wondering, I have a question about the Palm Sunday reading of the Gospel. We have a local parish that routinely substitutes the reading of the Gospel with a mime acted out by a group of children with a few adults. The priest sits in the pews and watches it and doesn't read the gospel. We are confused. Some people have told us that this is okay, but others think it is wrong. I was trying to find some documentation to tell me if this is okay or not. I could not find anything on the internet, so I have two questions for you. Is the mime, in place of the gospel reading on Palm Sunday, an acceptable substitute? 
And if it is not, can you tell me where I can find documentation to present it to the parish committee? Well, I've never seen any documentation on that. Certainly, the gospel is to be read. Now, putting mime along with the gospel in Holy Week is very traditional. Da -da. We might not know that in this country, but the Holy Week services, particularly of Good Fr Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Eve night, they were originally mimes, and particularly the Good Friday service. That, uh, and it was rather dramatic in the old liturgy. Well, you know how on Good Friday the priests prostrate before the altar. And uh, years ago in the monastery, the old liturgy, we walked down the aisle on our knees and prostrated three times on the way up the aisle. And uh, there were uh, the, uh, the opening of the cross, ecce agnus, uh, ecce uh, lignum crucis, behold the wood of the cross. It was a passion play, and it was incorporated into the liturgy after it was a popular mind. The Holy Week services began all different ways all over Europe, and the church tried to put them together into something. So mime in itself is not inappropriate in church. And, and uh, now, uh, I suspect, I don't know this parish, probably the pastor has been aware of this background of the mime. And uh, I would think if you have the mime together with the reading, that would be very appropriate. It's uh, a little bit disappointing in more, more recent years with the Good Friday service. Uh, uh, I remember when the new ones came in about 45 years ago, and uh, our barber in the monastery, a local barber used to come to the monastery, on Holy Saturday, a man from Sicily, Frank, and he, he said to me, what do you think of the new Good Friday? Well, he's holding a, 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 a scissors. I said, well, Frank, what do you think? He said, the whole thing is phony. It's not like the good old days. It's not real. In my place, where I grew up in Italy, it was real. So I said, real? I said, what, did, what was real? He says, everybody's in the church. Everybody. The communists, uh, the bad girls, everybody's in church. It's all black. No candles, no light. And the priest comes out in all black, and he looks mad. And he stands in the middle of the altar. Open the door. And the mayor gets up, and he goes down, and he opens the door. And there's a little old lady, all in black. And he says, what do you want? Where is my son? I can't hear you. Come in. She comes to the middle of the church. What do you want? Where's my son? I can't hear you. Come up to the front. What do you want? Everybody's looking. Where's my son? He's dead. Ha! It was a mime. Now, let me tell you, you may laugh, but the people in that little Sicilian village, it was very real to them. And it's a mime. We have to smile at its simplicity, but also its faith. So I'm in favor of mimes. <laughs> Joe needs guidance. My daughter, who is a Roman Catholic, recently became engaged to a Jewish man, 
and from my understanding has agreed that their children will be raised Jewish, but also will be exposed to the Catholic religion. I like her prospective spouse, but I am disappointed that the children are not being brought up Catholic. As a former altar boy and strict Catholic, I would appreciate your advice on how to deal with this situation. The marriage is in a few months in a non-denominational ceremony. Well, it's a complicated situation. First of all, it, 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 it's your daughter, I believe, it's his daughter, who's Catholic. A Catholic is required to be married by a priest, or the bishop should give permission for someone else, possibly a clergyman of another denomination, for very good reason, to be the witness. It's not essentially that it has to be a priest, but only the bishop can uh, permit that. So, for instance, if the daughter of a clergyman is getting married, in the Catholic Church, the bishop could give that clergyman the right to do the marriage. Because the clergyman, priest, minister, rabbi, they are only witnesses. The couple marries each other. Secondly, uh, the Catholic Church requires that children be raised as Catholics. And I would suggest that you be sure about that. Uh, if they wanted to be married by a priest, they must promise to see their children raised as Catholic. Now, it doesn't mean that they can't have some involvement with the other denomination, perhaps occasionally going to services, particularly of their relatives, uh, weddings of uh, uh, relatives, funerals of relatives, also going to social events. Uh, and uh, I know a number of families where one me member of the marriage is Jewish, and the Catholics participate in different things uh, at the, ceremony, the synagogue, going to things and uh, dinners and celebrations and things like that. Uh, uh, the Oneg Shabbat, the Sabbath supper. Uh, and uh, when there are two people from two different denominations, they have to try to have some understanding on both sides because of the needs that people have. But a Catholic marrying a non-Catholic person must be able to promise the children will be raised as Catholic. Now, I suppose that's why they're not being married by a priest. And uh, they're also not being married by a rabbi. They're being married to a non-denominational service. And uh, I hope and pray that things will work out in the future. Uh, and uh, sometimes things do work out uh, and uh, work out well. But what everything, bitterness should be avoided. Uh, one of the old saints who said, in dubiis libertas, in uh, 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 in uh, unitas veritas. In doubtful things, there is liberality, but in certain things, there must be truth. Mm. So, I, 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 I'm sorry to hear what you're saying, and uh, I think that the members of the family are somewhat limited on whether to be able to go to the wedding. The parents immediate relatives can do it because it would cause too much bitterness. But they're not supposed to look too happy. I always say it at the reception, instead of having champagne, 
have black coffee. Uh, that's to, something of a joke. But, uh, but you have to be sy sympathetic or gentle with the people involved. Coming on uh, like uh, bangbusters, gangbusters, is not going to do any good either. And often, often, these things do work out, and the marriage later on becomes rectified in the church. You know that yourself. You, you've done it many times, Father Lynch, right? Straightened out, oh, yeah. quietly uh, yes. worked out marriages. So let's pray for this couple and that things will be working out. Thank you, Father John, being our uh, visitor every week, our leader of our uh, questions. And we'll be back in a couple more weeks when we have another holiday and we'll have a, uh, another question and answer. May Almighty God bless each one of us, all who watch the program, whatever their denomination is, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we hope that you will continue to support EWTN and help us to keep this wonderful series of programs on EWTN, the whole network over the years. God bless. <laughs> ¶¶